Good evening. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows are attending your meeting, and I welcome them in your name. Minutes. Society of Antiquaries of London, ordinary meeting, Thursday the 25th of March 2021, and the meeting took place online only. Mr. Paul Drury, President in the Chair. The minutes of the previous ordinary meeting of Thursday the 18th of March 2021 were read and will be signed at Burlington House. This being a meeting for the election of fellows, the following were declared elected. Graham Kirkham, Tina Manny, Dominic Mashek, Mariel McClatchy, Griffin Murray, Naomi Payne, Sarah Perry, George Roberts, Anita Smith, Sean Steadman, Tessa Wilde, Rob Wiseman, and Christopher Claxton Stevens. The certificates of the following candidates for election were laid before the society and ordered to be suspended in the usual manner. Heather Knight, Simon Maslin, Carol Mealy, Alex Mullen, Stuart Orton, Russell Palmer, Winfred Scott, Fabio Silva, Peter Smithurst, Samuel Turner, Lacey Wallace, and Robert Wellington. The following communication was then laid before the Society, Early Medieval Glassmaking at Glastonbury and Barking Abbeys by Dr. Hugh Wilmot, FSA. Thanks for a return for this communication before the President closed the meeting. Thank you. I'll sign these minutes as a true and complete record um, when I can get back to Burlington House. Meanwhile, if anyone has any corrections or comments, um, please email the General Secretary and they will be taken into account. We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear a paper, The Viking Phenomenon, Paradigms, Parameters and Progress by Professor Neil Price, FSA. Neil holds the chair of archaeology at Uppsala University, Sweden, where he has um, also been appointed distinguished professor by the Swedish Research Council. He trained at UCL and York before moving to Scandinavia in 1992, working for several years in rescue archaeology and then taking his PhD at Uppsala. Following academic posts at the universities of Uppsala, Oslo and Stockholm, he was appointed to the inaugural chair of archaeology at Aberdeen before returning to Sweden in 2014. A leading specialist in the Viking Age and the pre-Christian religions of the North, his researches have taken him to more than 40 countries. In 2017, Sweden's Royal Society of Sciences awarded him the Thoreus Prize for his lifetime achievements in Viking studies. His publications have appeared in 19 languages. He is a frequent consultant and contributor to television and film. Neil, the screen is yours. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to, to see you. I wish we could meet in person at Burlington House, but uh, the situation is as it is, so um, I hope it will work over Zoom instead. And I'll just start sharing my screen. There we go. As you know, what I'm going to be talking about this evening is the Vikings. And regardless of your own professional interests, everyone's heard of them, everyone has an image in their heads, and it usually looks something like this. There's nothing actually wrong with this picture, but it is stereotyped. It's maritime, masculine, and violent. And what I want to talk about this evening is a project that, uh, in, in lots of different ways, tries to get behind this image, tries to, to nuance it and, and um, get a bit closer to reality. The project is called The Viking Phenomenon. It's funded by the Swedish Research Council very generously for a period of 10 years. It began in 2016, finishing in 25. So we're now precisely halfway through. So it's a good point to take stock, assess where we are, and also a good point to communicate what we've been doing so far. 
It's based at Uppsala University, where I work. Uh, it has an affiliate at the National Museum of Antiquities. That's the, the lower logo that says Historiska that you can see there. In the, the core group, there are three of us, myself, uh, someone who many of you met online a couple of weeks ago when she lectured to the Society on International Women's Day. This is Dr. Charlotte Hedenfrenner Jonsson. She divides her time between Uppsala and the National Museum. And then Dr. Jon Ljungqvist, who is here at Uppsala. And together with us is a group of researchers, mainly from Sweden, also from Estonia, and a couple from the UK. And I thought for this talk tonight, what I'd start with is a little bit of the background as to how I came to put together this application. Um, what kind of things did I have in mind when I was trying to design the project from scratch? And I began with thinking about which aspects of the Viking Age have been explored in the 2000s. This is very much a selective list. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but these are the kinds of things that researchers, not only in archeology, span but also in related disciplines have been working on um, over the last 20 years or so. And the Viking specialists among you will probably be able to put names to some of these, um, some of these categories here and to the, to the, to the topics. And following on from that, uh, given the, the size of this grant, um, the, the, the kind of competition there'd be, I then started to wonder what was perhaps missing or neglected or, or maybe new that we could address in a 10 year investment. And in trying to answer that, I came up with a return to rather a fundamental question. How and why did what we call the Viking Age begin? And this is where we get back to the popular perception of the Vikings, the, this, this moment when the Scandinavian people started to apparently expand into the world um, rather rapidly on an unprecedented scale. We all know that the Viking Age is a historical construct. We've, we've invented it up to a point. But why and why just then and how did the Scandinavians start this process? And is it really justified to talk about a Viking age at all? So really the Viking phenomenon project is about origins, whether they're social, cultural, political, economic, or more, the origins of the Viking phenomenon itself. And not least also their contemporary legacies. And I'm going to come back to those um, in a moment. So in today's talk, what I'm going to do is present you with the project design and some preliminary results uh, here at the halfway point. When I was deciding what to talk about, I had a choice really. Should I go into enormous detail about individual parts of the project? But as you've realized, it's really very large, it's very broad. It encompasses lots of different research strands, any one of which could be followed up in its own lecture. And I decided instead to give you the big picture and then sort of focus on some individual things. It's not often that a project of this size comes along. This is, um, I, th I think it's the largest individual archaeology grant uh, in, in Sweden, which presents a challenge of what to do and how to do it and, and also how to talk about it. So tonight I'm going to give you a, a, a sort of a, a broad overview. But before I start that, I, I just want to briefly clarify some of the, the principles of this project, it, its parameters, if you like, some terms and conditions. And the first one might sound slightly strange. Beyond debates on terminology, by which I mean, what do we mean by Viking? That, that's a whole discussion in itself. The basis for this project is that the concept of the Viking Age really has a testable empirical reality that can be illuminated by the application of theory and interdisciplinary comparative analysis. Now, I realize it might sound odd to start a project like this by arguing that the Viking Age actually happened. <laughs> Good, says the, the Swedish Research Council. But over the last couple of decades, there has been a, a number of attempts that perhaps not intentionally, but have the, the effect of, of kind of deconstructing the Vikings out of existence, whether from the perspective of economic history that regards this notional Viking age essentially as a kind of regional manifestation of processes that are happening all over 
post-Roman Europe, a political and economic realignment, that almost as if it's a, I'm, I'm being a little bit unfair now, but almost as if it's a, a kind of um, early medieval EU with some particularly aggressive negotiators in the north. And at the other end of that scale, and this is the, the central book here and, and others like it, the idea that um, the Viking Age is entirely uh, a political, a colonial construct of the last 200 years, um, that the past entirely formed uh, in the, the image of the present um, for its own purposes. Our project essentially rejects those views for several reasons. First, this a recent map from the British Museum exhibition from 2014, a map of the Viking diaspora. The Scandinavian peoples were far from alone in traveling over large distances, but nonetheless, at this time, uh, the, the scale of this diaspora is unprecedented. The Scandinavians ranged over the territories of 37 present day countries. They came into contact with at least 50 contemporary cultures. No one else is doing this in just this way at just this time. And this map, by the way, is a conservative view. It could be expanded in the direction of those red arrows. Not to put too much of a moral spin on this, but I'm also uneasy about a view of history that writes out or plays down things like this. This is a map I, I often use. It's from Jean Renaud's book, Les Vikings en France. And every place name, every year, every arrow on this map is a Viking raid, um, most of them in the course of the ninth century. And what this shows, apart from anything that um, living in, in northwestern France was, was, was rather traumatic for, for a hundred year period, is, is what lies behind the, the, the convenient arrows and the place names and so on. This is a map of immense trauma, of carnage, of damage, of loss of life, of loss of liberty, of economic destruction. Um, if, if we could ask a citizen of, of Northwestern Francia, um, do, do you think this period of time is something that you experience in a special way? They would undoubtedly have answered yes. And I think we need to remember that. If the Viking Age is a defensible concept, I think we have to ask how porous is its chronology? This project does not begin with the raid on Lindisfarne in 793 and end with the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066. Uh, we not only see this much more as a, and I think rather conventionally now, as a, a, a fuzzier period of, of social transformations and so on, but one of the things we're looking quite critically at is whether it's time to pretty definitively dismantle one end of that boundary between the so-called Vendel period in British terms, this is, is the Middle Saxon period, and the Viking Age. So the project has a non-exclusive, we look at other things as well, but a non-exclusive focus on the period between about 750 and 850 and the decades either side. We also think it's important to remove what I've rather sort of grandly called the compartmentalization of gender and the neglect of the unfree from Viking studies. Slavery, as I'll come back to this several times this evening, but slavery is an absolutely fundamental component of the Viking Age Scandinavian experience. And it's time that we really put this back on a large scale. We're by no means the only project doing this, but it, it is important to remember this and to focus on it. Similarly with gender, although there are some absolutely wonderful studies of, for example, women in the Viking Age, including some excellent recent ones, um, Nonetheless, there is a risk that these end up in the classic museum display case of Viking women uh, treated in more or less the same way as uh, the, the, the pottery or the metalworking in, in the cases either side, rather than as, as half of humanity. This project very firmly addresses people in the Viking Age. And if there's one takeaway from, from this project above all that I'd like to leave you with, it's the idea that the people of the Viking Age were individuals as complicated in every way as we are, and why would anyone imagine that they were not? And the last of these parameters or principles is that it's impossible to viably study the Viking Age without understanding and engaging with the weight of its social impact and implications today. 
I hope you don't feel this is something of a distraction. Um, I'm going to return to this at, at the end, but I'm, I'm also going to clarify why it's so important. And I think this is uh, an aspect of Viking studies that perhaps differs a little from the study of other periods of the past. Um, it's something that I, I think Viking, Viking scholars really have an obligation to, to engage with. Okay, so the Viking phenomenon, when you look inside it, uh, is composed of two linked projects, each of which have several sub-projects, plus public outreach activities over the course of 10 years, of which, as I said, five has elapsed. So I'm going to start with the first of those overarching projects, which we called Boat Grave Culture, the subtitle of Scandinavian Societies and the Start of the Viking Age. And this, this part of the work is directed by Jon Ljungqvist. And the key research question here, which I, I mentioned earlier, is really why and when and how did the raids begin? This is accepting an image of the Viking Age largely defined from the outside, the, the impact of the raiding, but explored from the inside. Where did that come from? What social groups produced those raiding parties? Why then? Why in that form? Were they part of larger processes? And this involves two sub-projects, both desk-based post-excavation. The first of them at the cemetery of Valsierda in Upland. This is just down the road from where I'm sitting now, and you can see it at the top of the screen there. And the second site at Salma on the island of Sarama off the coast of Estonia. Valsierda uh, is, is uh, essentially a, a large hill on a, a flat plain. You can see it here on a very stormy day, excavated over a period of nearly 40 years by the Department of Archaeology here at Uppsala. And the entire hill is a necropolis. You can see a, a, a plan on, on the right there with all those elliptical boat shapes, and they are indeed boat graves, some 15 of them. Uh, all of which we, we believe to be the burials of, of men. In terms of dates, they appear to have been laid out once per generation. Around them, which you can't see as much on this map, 63 cremations and chambers, which seem to be largely the burials of women. And all of this over a date range from the sixth to 11th centuries um, of the common era. And what this provides in a single place is a window on a community's attitudes to death and life, not only during the Viking Age, but also long before it. So it gives us a, a, a really good time depth spanning the whole of the later Iron Age. If we move to Salma on Saramar Island, this is much more recent excavation. Some of you may have come across it. It made quite a big impact when it came up. Um, excavated between 2008 and 2012 by archaeologists from Tallinn and Tartu, two boat graves with, astonishingly, a respective seven and 34 men on board. The 34 men in the larger ship were buried in a, a circular mound in the middle of the boat, and you can see it in the inset here. Very complex rituals, including a mound of shields on top of these dead men, the mass killing of birds and fish and dogs, and the possible presence of a king in the middle of it all, um, all accompanied by extraordinarily rich uh, repertoire of, of grave goods. A very interesting date, dead on 750. Isotope analyses have shown that almost all the Salma men came from the Mela Valley of central Sweden. And that's this area where I am now. Valsjärda is in the heart of the Mela Valley. It's, it's the, the area um, sort of north and south of this big lake on which Stockholm sits today. The Salma graves have very close affinities with the material culture of the upland boat grave cemeteries, like Valsjärda. If we look at the material, the Salma people may even be the Valsjärda people. And if they didn't, they come from just down the road. DNA has suggested that all the Mela men in the Salma boats, there's four of them seem to be from Gotland, came from a very extended group of family relations. Among them, there are four brothers buried side by side. So this is a tight knit group of people from a very specific place. And this is the territory of the Sphere, 
these are the 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 the, the, the population group that would eventually expand you know, centuries later to become the Swedes. Even today's um, modern name for Sweden in Swedish, Sveria, it means the kingdom of the sphere. Is this a sphere expedition gone wrong? Very wrong. Um, it, it would seem to have quite critical implications for the nature and date of early maritime raiding beginning in the Baltic rather than the West. Something I should have mentioned, by the way, is that almost all these men have, have very severe weapon trauma. The Salma boat graves are, are very much an Estonian project. It's directed by Yuri Pitts from Tallinn University with Marga Konza from Tartu, who co-excavated the first boat. And there is a, a core excavation team all at Tallinn University. Although this is entirely under Estonian direction, it is part of the Viking Phenomenon project because the post-excavation work by the Estonian team and the publications of the burial are funded by us because of this connection to our core area in central Sweden and specifically Valsjöda. The Valsjöda cemetery itself, um, it's a bit, of a, a bit of a sorry tale really. Uh, uh, the excavations finished in the 1950s. Before our project began in 2016, only six of the 15 boat graves and none of the other burials were published. So part of our project um, of objectives is the publication of the rest of the cemetery in its entirety. Uh, that doesn't take long to say, but I think you can all appreciate what publishing um, nine boat graves entails, not to mention the other 63 burials. So taking that first project, Boat Grave Culture, as one, from Valsierda to Salma, using these sites as a window onto that, that time and place, we're studying the, in metaphorical terms, the first Vikings at home and away. The second part of the Viking phenomenon, the second project is called Viking Economics, and it explores the social processes that underpinned Vikingness that partly defined it. And this is directed by Charlotte, who you met a couple of weeks ago. The key premise here is that the kind of Viking triad of raiding and slaving and trading should be seen as a set of totally integrated activities. Essentially, they're all part of the same thing. There are five sub-projects here, focusing on the ideologies of all this, the, the, the very delicate politics of pirate communities, even the, the, their political construction, the idea of a, a new government of the ship. Um, it's a, a concept drawn from, from later comparative pirate research. Looking at the social dynamics of Vikingness, demographics, gender, identity, slavery, I mentioned before, systems of unfreedom and forced labor, and infrastructure, how all this um, worked, the war bands, the armies, the fleets, the camps, the logistics that enabled all of this to function. And lastly, mechanisms of exchange, regulated trade. How did the trading component of this actually function? One of the things that underpins all this is the notion that the Viking world, as it appeared in the scholarship of, say, the 1980s, when I began my training, was something that was very much shaped by the Cold War, um, divided into a kind of rather illusory Eastern and Western Viking Age by the restrictions of modern politics on, on our scholarship. And I think it's important, and we're, we're by no means alone in doing this, but shifting this perception of that kind of Viking world to a much more globalized one that was bounded only by their effort and imagination. So these, this idea of an Eastern and Western Viking Age as separate entities is increasingly irrelevant in our new realities. And the key point here is it's the same individuals that travel long distances across a fluid diaspora from the eastern seaboard of North America to the Asian steppe. And we need to discuss them in the same terms in those different regions. It's also clear that Viking groups were, to a degree, multi-ethnic. We have to broaden this beyond Scandinavia itself. I mentioned earlier the, the difficulty of summarizing this project in a sort of 40 minute lecture um, like, like this evening's. 
just in the period 2016 to 20, um, these are some of the fields of focus in the Viking economics strand of the project. I'm not going to go through all this list, but you can you can get the idea by focusing on um, essentially military structures of various kinds. Um, a focus also on the Rus, these, these, um, this rather complicated ethnicity of the Eastern river systems, very much connected with, with central Sweden, um, something that, that Charlotte, for example, is a, is a specialist in, looking at contacts with Central Asia and the Far East, sort of extending this a little bit, I, I'll come back to that in a moment. Different aspects of trade and exchange, and also systems of slavery and the identities that, that kept sort of Viking society together. It's a long list. As part of this, um, we have to really acknowledge that this is funded by the Swedish Research Council. They are quite keen on a Swedish experience. Um, that can be problematic in some ways. Um, I'll, I'll return to that at the end. But there is, quite naturally, from this part of the world, a, a particular focus on the Vikings' eastern travels, though that doesn't mean a discrete eastern world. It's slightly different things. So looking at the Black Sea, the Caucasus, the Caspian, the Aral Sea, and the caravan routes to the Caliphate and the Gulf and so on. And just to give you one example of the, um, the, the, the ways in which this can be measured, um, small things with very big implications. This is a rune stone, um, rather a modest one from Vestmanland, the province just to the west of, of me here in central Sweden, with an inscription that seems to commemorate a man who died at Chorezm. You can see the red dot on the map. This is an oasis in what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia. That is a very long way from someone, for someone from Central Sweden to travel. This man didn't come back, but clearly somebody else did with the story. The story came home when the man did not. And the very modesty of this stone, I think, implies something about the scale of this kind of um, travel. When we look at a map of the, the eastern region of the diaspora, if you can see my cursor, this shaded area here, this is the, the, the extent of sort of primary Rus influence. Here's Sweden. This is the, the Eastern Baltic, just to orient you. The, the maps tend to stop around here somewhere, but actually this plugs into a much larger world. The caravan routes, the Silk Roads, essentially extending into Central Asia. You can see the Khorezm Oasis marked with the red dot there again. And just again, as an indication of how far this goes, there's a, a key Arab text from the 840s, the Book of Itineraries and Kingdoms, that describes the Rus as actually physically themselves going to China. We can debate what Alcyon actually means in this context, probably the Uyghur Khaganate, but even so, you, you have to follow that red arrow off the map. They get a very long way. So while boat grave culture, the first project in this, um, in, in, the, in the overall structure, is focused on two sites, two quite focused things, the Viking economic strand is much more about networking on internationalization, on interdisciplinary collaboration. And these, these questions are being explored in thematic workshops and conferences. We've had eight so far in a range of countries. You can see them on the screen. Um, with instead of site reports, our outputs here are edited volumes and journal papers. OK. Some preliminary thoughts about where we are at the halfway mark. And what I'm going to talk about now is a mixture of direct outcomes of our projects, but also the interfaces of those things with other Viking scholars' research. We're, we're not working in, in, um, I, I, in, uh, in isolation by any means. I'm still going to try and draw out some, quite a, it's still a big picture, but some key directions that we're going in that I think is starting to, uh, to draw a different picture of that Viking phenomenon of the early Viking age. And the first thing to say is that this has a long time depth. Obviously, Scandinavian links with Europe go back millennia. We can go to the Bronze Age and, and further back. But that's also the truth. That's also the case even for the East. 
there is a clear presence in Scandinavia of Eastern imports prior to the Viking Age. We have garnets from India and Sri Lanka in, in really substantial quantities, thousands of them. Uh, cowries from the Gulf, we have Byzantine cameos, a lot more. There are active trade and import connections, even with the overland and maritime silk roads, perhaps as far back as the 500s, with links that ultimately go to China, as I mentioned, Silla in Korea, and even Nara, Japan. So this is a very long, late Iron Age. This is not a Viking Age that starts with the raid on Lindisfarne. I think we really have to go back to the so-called crisis of the migration period in Scandinavia. Um, we could debate almost every word of that phrase, but as many of you will be familiar with, it's a, a convenient way of describing the period from the late 400s to the end of the sixth century that in Scandinavia saw a very steep decline in the numbers of settlements, cemeteries, and other markers of human activity to a variable degree, but measurable all across Scandinavia. There's lots of explanations have been put forward for this. It's very clear that no one factor stands out. This is a combination of things. Is it the economic disruption as the, the Roman Empire declined, the discontinuities in production and trade? Is it political instability, the knock-on effects of all that? Warfare at both local and a regional scale. And some of you may have cross, come across the uh, quite extensive work now on the volcanic eruptions that seem to have begun in 536, continuing for several years with very severe environmental impacts. I would say all of the above and some more. But the point for this project is that we have to wonder whether the slow process of recovery, um, getting back from all that, can it be seen as a break with an earlier way of life? Not a clean break, but a, a ragged one. And the beginnings, slowly, of something new. And this is where we get to the eve of the Viking Age, the 200 years or so before the Salma expedition that came to grief, the rise of a new militarized elite, what we used to call the Vendel period, and the whole culture that sustained them, a deeply hierarchical society, very aggressive and expansionist, um, living in monumental landscapes of kind of self-aggrandizement, with um, very clear markers of political and spiritual legitimation, sort of um, drawing their, um, their, their genealogies back to, to the gods of, of the, the, the religion that's more familiar from the Viking Age, sustained by warband retinues and long distance commerce. Um, the people of places like Gamla Uppsala, um, rulers who looked something like this. If you just excuse me while I take a drink of water. <clears throat> so why did the Viking Age begin? There's been a lot of work on this over the past sort of 10 years or so. A lot of um, really quite interesting papers by a range of people, some of you perhaps watching this evening. Um, I think a key text is really James Barrett's paper from 2008, What Caused the Viking Age? Followed up with Steve Ashby, what really caused the Viking Age? I'm tempted to publish one called uh, What Actually Caused the Viking Age? But uh, lots more since then. Um, there's no broad consensus, nor should there be, I think. But we can look at a, a debated menu of determinism. So technological factors, environmental factors, so demographics, economic things, whether it's politics, ideology, a mixture of those. Is it more a matter of social context and, and interactions? Was there ever a smoking gun for the Viking expansion? And it won't surprise you to hear that for our project, it's, it's already very clear that no, we don't think there was. There was no single cause, no trigger. Instead, we see this as a logical extension of a lot of different intersecting gradual processes that have been set in motion centuries earlier. It is possible to trace that Viking phenomenon quite clearly, we think, going back at least a couple of centuries and probably more. Not least, raiding had long been the norm inside Scandinavia for a long while before the Viking Age. What changed, we think, was its developing projection outwards, initially east 
remember Salma in the Baltic, then west, and those are the more famous raids, first slowly and then with increasing momentum. And long distance trade followed the same paths as it had done for centuries, but now with the difference that the Scandinavians were increasingly going to the sources themselves. When was this happening? We think the mid eighth century, more or less, plus or minus 20 years or so, substantially earlier than the classic Lindisfarne first view of the Viking Age. And I, th I think social scientists might, might regard this as a singularity, um, one of those rare historical occurrences where lots of different factors come together in an initially haphazard way, but combining to doing something really quite um, dramatic. To very briefly give you a sort of political background to that, if we look in the West in Norway, and this is very much based on the work of Dag Finskrier and his colleagues in Oslo, the rising power of the Norwegian sea kings at manors like Arvelsnes, the place you see on the screen there, sends them further afield to ensure the continued flow of wealth that will consolidate their control. Darwin has a slightly different view of this. He thinks it's that the um, people like these sea kings force others to go abroad, but we, we can debate that. In the south, this is the work of people like Søren Sinbeck in, in, in Aarhus. Um, the Danish state, which begins to consolidate quite early, interacting with the continental powers and founding an advanced network of economic centers, such as Reber, you can see on the screen there, and others along the southern Baltic Rim. And raiding into the North Sea supports those landowners and their retinues. And then round here in the east of Scandinavia, the Sphere, the people I mentioned earlier, the Gutar, they're the people of Gotland, consolidate their power structures by extending trade connections directly into the river systems of Eastern Europe. A kind of muscular commerce, founding markets like Ladoga, this is the, the mouth of the Volkhoff River, um, and, and causing conflict, as we, I think we might see reflected at Salma. And behind all this, coincident with it, we've got to remember the importance of individual agency, people looking for personal improvement, landed wealth, better social prospects, perhaps for marriage, political advancement, network connections, or a different kind of life. This isn't a huge intricate mechanism. It's also something very personal. Everyone caught up in the same events and processes for different reasons and with different agendas. Some of them, I think, were aware of that, some not, across this enormous world of encounters kind of the same map, but perhaps a subtly different kind of diaspora. At the beginning, I mentioned the Vikings' contemporary legacies. One of the reasons why uh, we've put quite a lot of emphasis on this in the project and why I'll, I'll talk about it now is that it's a very, um, very outspoken priority of the Swedish Research Council. And for various reasons, it's quite an urgent social issue in Scandinavia. It's no exaggeration to say that the Vikings are probably the foremost expression of cultural identity in Sweden, for better or worse. Um, and they, they loom very large in the, 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 out, the, sort of the, the rest of the world's perception of Scandinavian history. And as you know, um, if, if if compiling a, a slide like this, you could just go on and on and on, take your pick from thousands of images, whether it's the Victorians, whether it's Wagnerian opera, whether it's the Nazis, modern commercialism and tourism and sport and reenactment and gaming, entertainment, whether it's TV, film, whatever, and beyond. The Vikings are seemingly everywhere. And that is quite unusual for a, a past people to be taken up in this way. I'm not even sure that the, the, the Pharaonic Egyptians or, or, or the Imperial Romans are, are used to um, this degree, perhaps in architecture, but uh, not in this sort of a saturation of, of everyday experience. And it's a tangled web of gendered politics, of identity, ideology, pride and prejudice, creativity, commerce, and sometimes an actual interest in the Viking Age, which changes over time and varies, varies from one place to another. And if we try and draw out some of the keystones of that Viking image, I think we have to look at militant masculinity, especially white masculinity, a very particular Nordic construction of heritage, 
the idea of the strong Viking woman and also silly fun. What all those things have in common is that ultimately they're vectors for admiration. And when it comes to the Vikings, that can be very problematic. The debatable, because we could argue about this, the debatable reality, certainly as our project sees it, was a Viking age of, for example, multiple genders, ethnicities, identities, a very diverse period of time that acknowledged those differences and all um, within a set of worldviews that were very unlike our own. And that all needs to be communicated and discussed, contested, debated in all that complexity, both within the academy and through outreach. And I'd just in brief say that interesting is not the same as admirable. We tried to do that in all kinds of different ways. One of them you heard about on International Women's Day from my colleague Charlotte, the, um, the very controversial female Viking warrior, in inverted commas, from Birka. That was a product of, of our project. Um, and whatever your position on that, it certainly challenged assumptions and generated an enormous amount of debate. And it confronted those kinds of stereotypes that I mentioned earlier. We've done an awful lot of outreach, um, perhaps more than, than many projects of this kind, partly because it's part of the, the, the Swedish Research Council's explicit mission for what they want us to do. We worked a long time with National Geographic. Um, they spent weeks with us in the project, in the field, in the office, uh, a cover story in their magazine, all kinds of extra things around the world, not just our project, other Viking scholars involved in as well. A global audience, they tell us, of 31 million. I think this was kind of half successful. This is the thing that the Swedish Research Council were very excited about. Um, we didn't choose the cover images. This is very much the traditional Viking age, but as a, a means of mass communication, along with um, lots of other articles in popular science magazines and so on, I think this is really getting the, the ideas and the conclusions of our project out to a very large audience. The University Museum here at Uppsala, Uppsala, the Gustavianum, has also put on a touring exhibition that we designed and produced within the project, touring the Valsierda finds from those boat burials in particular um, around the United States beginning in 2018 and concluding this year. Uh, the Vikings begin. So looking at that, that period just before the Viking Age, um, this has had record attendances. It's been really very successful. You've noticed in um, a lot of the previous slides that I've used images from this. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Perhaps some of you have watched all six seasons of the History Channel drama series Vikings. Some of you probably watched none of it. Some of you watched one episode and thought, no. But the key point for us is that more people encounter the Vikings through media like this, and particularly this TV show than through anything specialists like us will ever produce. And if we want to address the Vikings legacies as we have to in this project, we think it's imperative to engage with this. One of the, the pathways to this early on in the project, this 2016 and 17, was uh, a documentary commissioned by History Channel to be screened immediately after the episodes of the drama series, um, combining archeologists and historians including several fellows of the society, with cast members from the series to discuss aspects of that kind of real Viking age behind their dramatised one. Um, inevitably a little bit superficial, but I, I think we got the chance to, to really talk in some detail about some of these issues. Um, nine countries went from, from Arctic Norway to the north of Spain, and it seems to have um, really had quite substantial impact. If we look at the more conventional um, products of the project, the publication so far. A number of, I think, quite useful volumes. The first new Valsieda report for 40 years, um, Bo Gresland's book on the origins of the Viking Age through re-evaluating re Beowulf. That's coming out in English translation very soon. Uh, two volumes um, publishing the 1870s excavations of Birka, founded at just that sort of 80, uh, 750s um, uh, seven sort of nineties that this early period, the catalogue of the exhibition I mentioned. Some of these things are wholly funded by the project; others part funded. So we're sort of adding value by connecting with other other 
initiatives. But taken together, the project outputs for the first five years are nine books, including um, my own synthesis that came out a few months ago, more than 50 peer reviewed papers and book chapters, nearly 100 conference presentations, 60 odd public lectures. We have our own seminar series, um, worked with schools, articles in popular science magazines, as I mentioned, and an awful lot of media interviews and um, appearances. In addition to that, we also have a dedicated book series at Routledge, Archaeologies of the Viking World, um, in which early career search researchers principally are publishing their work, connecting with the wider themes of the project. So, the Viking Phenomenon Project is presenting a number of challenges and possibilities, but here at the end, I, I just want to emphasize very firmly, this is a deliberate position, that we're not trying to present any definitive histories. And by that, I don't mean any wariness about the nature of expertise, certainly not. I, I'm very concerned about certainty in the Viking Age. Certainty is a bit of a bugbear in Viking studies. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that this project um, not only changes during its lifetime, but this is our Viking age. We don't all agree within the project. It's not trying to present a, a single view. Even that synthesis I mentioned just now, that's my Viking age. It might not be yours. And I think that's something that's very important to acknowledge. Equally, the work of other scholars that is intersecting with this, I mentioned Dagfinn Skrey in, in, um, in Western Norway, for example, they also go in their own different directions, as we would expect. The Viking Age is a, is a rich seam that can be mined, and I think we're going to be um, taking this in lots of different directions. This is a phrase from a review of that book that I really liked. I, I thought quite hard about this. The better we understand the Vikings, the more comfortable we are with how little we actually know about them. Um, that worried me at first when I read that, and the more I read it, the more comfortable I got with that point of view. Yes, this is exactly right. And I think we have to actively embrace that uncertainty. In terms of our longer term objectives, um, there are two that are kind of the same thing, but um, we'll see how it goes. We have five years left. Within two or three years, we're going to have to start thinking about extended funding applications and so on. The ambition is a permanent center of excellence. And that phrase is one of, and I'm, you'll be familiar the, with this from the UK in different permutations, but centers of excellence is one of the um, Swedish government's new um, sort of buzzwords or, or key concepts. Um, they, they, they've just sort of caught up to this. Um, and interdisciplinary research environments, that's where the Swedish Research Council is going. So something like this at Uppsala for the study of this period in world history. And there's lots of different ways to achieve that. We'll see how it goes. Um, and, and perhaps in five years time, I, I might be able to come back and, and, and uh, sort of report back on that. I hope this has given you at least a, a rough outline of what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing um, in the course of this 10 year project. One of the things I really appreciated about the, um, the Swedish Research Council was th the lack of pressure that they place on these really major research investments. Um, I won't go so far as to say they're prepared for us to fail, but they, they are certainly open to the, the concept of risk and especially to the idea that at the beginning of that 10 year track, we might um, or almost certainly won't have any uh, certain idea of where we'll be at the end of it. And that's something that they like, uh, that academic freedom um, to design and adjust and respond um, as the research changes is something I, I'm really very, um, very grateful for. Thank you to a very large range of people. Um, you've already heard from my colleague Charlotte talking about um, identity and gender, amongst other things, in, in the Viking Age. Uh, if you're interested in any of this, I know that other members of the project would be delighted to, to, to talk to you about it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this evening, and thank you for listening. And I shall stop my screen now, I think. There. Thank you, Neil. Um, 
for that uh, account of a, a, the kind of project that I think is almost unthinkable in the UK in terms of funding and, and length and the, um, the connection between social issues and the archaeological past. Now, I should have said at the beginning um, to type questions into the chat function, though I'm sure everyone realizes um, the system after so many months. Um, so let, beginning to look at the questions. Um, what is the ethnic origin of the people in central Sweden who started the expansion and raiding in the mid eighth century? Where did they come from? I think for that, we'd have to go so far back into prehistory that, um, and I, I, I don't mean this dismissively, but I, not only do I, I don't think that's particularly relevant for what we're doing, um, in the context of all those contemporary leg legacies, in Sweden, and obviously I'm not talking about the, the, the question itself, but in Sweden, that is a distinctly weaponized question. Um, the sphere people that I mentioned, uh, if you go a little bit to the west, to the lakelands in what is now Sweden, you have the Jörtar, um, and even the uh, the current province names mean eastern Jörterland and western Jörterland. Um, if you do a, a, a television interview about the sphere, you will get hate mail from people who think that actually it's the Jörtar that founded modern Sweden and so on. And I think the best way to get past that is to say that this this is just not a, when we go back into sort of deep ethnic origins, it's just not something that we need to talk about. And most importantly, I think it goes far back into the, pre, the prehistoric past. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation on the scope and foci of this vast project. In addition to the necessary humanization of the historical phenomenon associated with the cultural contact and communication along and beyond the, quote, borders, unquote, of Europe, I wonder whether the use of the term Viking might be more usefully applied to describe, quote, Viking, unquote, activities rather than peoples, insofar as the word in current usage both popular and scholarly, um, continues to have an almost ethnic connotation. Would you care to comment? Yes, um, right at the very beginning when I showed that slide about um, the Viking Age being kind of real, um, there was a little bit I put in there about beyond the, I've forgotten the exact wording, something like beyond the, debate, the debates of terminology, and that's exactly what I was referring to. It's something that any Viking scholar has to deal with. Um, Personally, I, um, I, I, I often say that uh, you know your Viking conference is in trouble when someone says, what do we mean by Viking? It's an insoluble problem. Um, we can get past it to a certain degree in that it's very clear that the, the word in Old Norse, vikingar, refers to something like pirates, although not quite with the, the modern connotations of that mm -hmm. term. Some people um, use uh, title case or lower case, depending on whether they're talking about sort of real Vikings or, or the general populace. Um, we, we thought about this quite deeply at the beginning of the project. Um, it, I hope this doesn't sound a cop out to say that the title of the project itself is, is something that helped us to get the money quite simply. Mm -hmm. But um, in the end, we feel we're stuck with it. It, it, is an, uh, it has different connotations, but I think it's better to try and nuance those as far as possible, to deconstruct them and say that rather than to get away from it completely, because I just don't think we're going to succeed. Um, if, if you go to the National Museum, you have the Viking galleries, um, there are Viking museums, there the Viking experience at different kinds of places, you know, we, we're just not going to get rid of it. So I think we have to deal with it rather than... Um, try to, to dismiss it. Thank you. Um, could we talk a little bit about the term diaspora? Perhaps it's a North American hang-up, but I've seen a lot of pushback about it because the term usually implies a forced scattering because of conquest or some other outside force, um, a point on which I would disagree. Um, think of the Irish diaspora, for example. Um, uh, 
definitely not voluntary and often militaristic activity. Um, is there another less politically charged term which we could use that doesn't have the same connotations for other members of the academic community? I take the point, but I, I also disagree. Um, I think the, the factors that the, the, the questioner mentions are certainly there in the concept of diaspora, but I think it's in a Viking context, it's been used to um, talk about, uh, uh, to try and find an umbrella term for an awful lot of different processes, some of which are not forced, some of which are rather more haphazard. Um, it was um, first coined, I think, by Leslie Abrams and Judith Yesh, um, as an alternative to what we used to talk about all the time, which was the Viking expansion, which is very much a term that conjures up a process and an intent, which I, I don't think Viking scholars really see as a total explanation for what the Viking phenomenon was. Um, so I would, I, I do understand it's also been used in, a, um, in a, a, an African context or in a, a Jewish context, for example. But I think as a term, it, it's actually a lot more neutral than the alternatives. That, that's how I would see it. But, but certainly that the point is valid as well. I, to, to me, diaspora implies a, a goodly proportion of of those involved actually moving permanently and settling elsewhere in the Jewish diaspora, for example. And to what extent did the Vikings who penetrated um, east from Europe, for example, um, actually to any extent settle there um, and uh, I suppose become part of the local population? To a very great extent. Um, the, the I mentioned this term several times, the Rus. Um, it's a very particular ethnicity and identity that develops along the eastern river systems. It's also an identity that changes over time. There's been well over a century of debate as to the degree to which that is synonymous with essentially eastern Vikings or whether it is um, something more complicated. The general consensus now is that it's certainly not totally Scandinavian, but there is a very large Scandinavian component, especially in a, a leadership capacity. And in the course of the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries, there are a whole series of settlements established along those, those river systems in the east, mainly in Russia and what's now the Ukraine, but also in Eastern Europe and, and further east as well, um, that have a, a lasting contribution. And it's clear that people from Scandinavia are settling in those places. So there is a sort of a more permanent um, population. But it's also important to remember that it's also a mobile population. So those same people go back and they visit their relatives or their more distant relatives over time. Um, there are uh, very clear political connections. So the time you get into the late Viking age, the, the rulers of places like Sigtuna are mar marrying off their daughters to the rulers of, of, of those, those river systems like, like uh, Kiev and Novgorod. Um, and, and it's part of the way in which the Viking Age sort of ends uh, in that gradual dispersion of influence. And, and it also comes back to the concept of diaspora because it's that gradually loosening set of connections to a very particular concept of homeland. Um, so it, it's part of that big process. Thank you. Um, next. Um... Does your perspective on the background to and origins of the Viking Age, as summarized here, as a process of quite long-term development, adequately explain the decision taking in, taken in the 1790s to att attack really major monasteries like Lindisfarne and Iona? If so, does it imply that those sites were targets simply because they were materially so rich? Are you happy with such a model? I think it's a combination of two things. I think that when you, you look at the 790s onwards and into the early 800s, it's clear that this is speeding up. Um, up to a certain point, I think they clearly are targeted. I think there's a really quite extensive knowledge of what it is that they're targeting. This um, something that... Uh, um, John Hines, amongst others, many, many years ago, um, was looking at these, these much longer term connections across the North Sea, for example. I think we can see that acceleration 
an, it's an acceleration of decision making apart from anything else to do this. It still is, is within that longer term context. But I think if we're looking for an explanation of the, the escalation of that early phase of raiding, I think it's probably that nothing succeeds like success. Um, if you came back at all from one of these, um, you had the potential to, to come back in a really life changed way um, and people noticed. And I think the, the temptation of doing that next summer is not terribly difficult to understand. I don't think it necessarily has to have um, very sort of elaborate mechanics. And I think also we shouldn't see those raids, any of them, as having a single motivation. The captain of a ship has a very different idea of what's going on to someone who's just come along. And the captain of the ship may not be the person who paid for it to be built and, and so on. And then you have the relatives of all those people. So I, I think those raids that you can see them in a way as a kind of microcosm of what the Viking age is about. It's all of those factors um, occasionally being expressed in a, a very sharp point. Um, so that's what I'd say for that. Thank you. Um, is there any overlap between this project and the work that Michael McCormick and his group are doing at Harvard? Not formally. Um, the simple answer is no. We, we don't have any direct contact with that group. Um, I also have to say I... I don't know their very latest work, like in the last sort of year or so. So um, if I wouldn't say there's any direct connections, no, but we're actually one of many groups working on things like this. There was the Oxford project on dirhams for slaves, for example, a few years ago. Um, there are several projects looking at sort of a, an economic view of the Viking age. There's one in Denmark looking at trading networks, all kinds of things. So we, we have... Um, I would say that I think the Scandinavian groups tend to have a sort of tighter geographical connections because we're all in the same place, but yeah. A quick question. Will any of this new research feature in the new Viking exhibition at Historiska? Some of it, yes. Um, you, you, you may know that um, the, in Oslo, um, the Norwegian government have uh, or are in the process of building a new, effectively a national museum of the Viking age, um, where the it's the same building as where the, the Viking ships are currently displayed at which they're enlarging and bringing all their Viking collections. This is going to be amazing. And as a result of that, um, the, the, the Swedish and Danish national museums have both thought, crikey, we better do something about this. And so there are new investments in the Viking galleries at those respective museums. The reason I, I'm giving you that background is that um, alone among the three, the three national museums, the Swedes have opted not to have um, any external involvement in it at all. So it's entirely an internal team. And I, I think it's fair to say that no one outside the museum is entirely sure what they're putting into it. Um, I, know, I know some things are, but uh, it's also, I think, remember what I said at the end about this being um, not a personal project in the sense of an indulgent, but indulgence, but we're not trying to say that now we've sorted out the Viking Age. This is our particular set of answers to those particular questions. And uh, it's perhaps not the... <sighs> One can debate about how definitive a message national museums tend to communicate, but um, I, I think the, the Swedish National Museum is going to be going for a slightly more they're going to step back a little bit further from this. Thank you. Um, do you have any settlement sites where it is possible to find evidence of what they ate? How did they survive on their long sea voyages? Did they exist mainly on marine resources? Or did they raid cattle and other domestic animals? Or were they also hunters? Uh, I think all of the above. Um, in terms of what they ate on long journeys, um, we know that they use whey as a preservative. Um, we find big barrels of it, so they're, they're keeping preserved meats and things. Um, obviously, there's fishing resources. Uh, the Salma boat graves that I mentioned, that there were a lot of fish in those graves. It's an absolutely extraordinary variety of fish. I can't remember how many species, but it's an awful lot. It's not just something that you could pick up. They've clearly been able to select from a, a very wide repertoire of, of fish types. Um, 
and I think we can think of dried meat and things like that. So, uh, and then when they get to where they're going, uh, they're foraging and hunting and stealing and, and so on. But that is an aspect when we look at the really big Viking forces, like the armies that are, are moving around England in, in the ninth century. Um, the investigations by a number of scholars looking at the, uh, the, the winter camps um, at uh, Repton and Torxey and places like that, they're really underlining the scale of the logistics that are needed to, to keep an army like that in the field. Um, and I think we have to expand our horizon of where they're getting their resources from and how. So that's, it's a really important question. Thank you. Is there a good account in English of the excavations at Salma? Not yet. Um, there are a couple of uh, popular accounts in, I can't remember which one now, I think it's the American magazine Archaeology. I think there's something in current world archaeology. The, um, the final report of the excavations is in two volumes, of which the first volume is coming out later this year, and the second volume will be next year. And they're, they're going to be huge. So. Now, um, and in English, obviously. Sorry. A, a practical question. How important has the project design been? And is it something that we can all learn from? Um, it was quite a tactical project design, although the um, the uh, the second project strand, Viking Economics, the, the, the name of that, I think, is quite appropriate for what we're talking about. Um, I looked at the previous grants that have been awarded from this scheme and realised that they were quite keen on economics in all its forms. So that's why it's called Viking Economics. Um, I, I think that uh, what was most helpful for, to me is looking at previous um, successful applications. And this scheme is open to any subject, arts, sciences, anything at all. And there's only 10 of them. So, and there's, there's one in the humanities of that 10. So um, it's, it's a bit random. Uh, I just to, to you, you said earlier that this is a, a, a kind of investment that is unlikely in Britain. Um, I, I just terrify you all by saying that the very first time they ran this, the application was four pages of A4 free text. That was it. Um, okay. And there are no interviews or anything like that. So, uh, and no stage two, that, that is it. When, when I applied, the application was 40 pages. So it, it's quite substantial. Um, I think it's quite responsive. They're, they are, as I, as I mentioned at the end, they're very aware of what the realities of a project like this is like. Um, one interesting point they came up with that, that might be useful to people is they were very, initially, they were very suspicious of the idea that the humanities could scale up research questions to something commensurate with a 10 year investment. Um, and I, I hope we've shown them that that is a misconception. Um, obviously not just for us, but for, but for the humanities in general, I think we're all capable of scaling up our ideas. And it's a very important message to get across to the, um, or the, the research councils that I think, as, as you know, that tend to favor science subjects. Um, whether they will carry on doing this, I don't know. As with any country, it's subject to the vagaries of you know, new trends in research and new um, priorities and so on, but uh, yeah. Um, now, um, could you tell us more about the sub-projects concerning Christianization and conversion? Uh, there isn't one. Right. <laughs> but, uh, is, it, is it an issue in, in, in the project at all? Um, a little bit. Uh, I mean, the Christi Christianization process is is slow moving un until it goes really fast in some places and then not in others. It is, although there's certainly missionaries active in, in the ninth century and Scandinavians have come into contact with Christians for, for a very long time, it, in terms of an actual conversion, however one views it, that is a feature of the sort of middle and later parts of the Viking Age, which are broadly speaking after the time frame of this project. So it's not something that we're primarily concerned with. Um, 
one of my interests is also in pre-Christian religion, which it, it connects with that, obviously, but, but I'm really interested in the pre-Christian stuff itself. So I, I wouldn't really say we're addressing that in, in detail. Um, I'm only going to take a few more of these now, I think. Um, do you consider the Salma and Valsgada ship burials to be a one-time phenomenon which had one-time use? or numerous uses, meaning that they were reused for burials? I think that um, the Salma boats, we'll have to wait for the final report from the Estonian team. Um, there has been a discussion about whether they are single events or cumulative ones. Um, my perception at the moment is that they are single events, but perhaps taking place, uh, well, depends how you define that. I mean, I think they might take a couple of weeks but as a, 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 a construct or a creation, I think they're a coherent thing. There are certainly some boat burials to which people return that have been left open for a while where people come and go and maybe bring things or take things away. That I think all Viking burials are places where you interact with the dead or the other world or, or whatever to a greater or lesser degree. At Valsierda, there doesn't seem to be any signs of people going back into the mounds. And there's very little overlap. So occasionally you get a burial dug into another one with some kind of secondary reuse. But I, I think they are discrete entities. They're also not that uncommon, at least on the um, on the Scandinavian mainland. There, there are several boat burial fields and there are several other burials which contain the same kinds of things, just not necessarily in boats. And I think the boat part of it is something that um, is largely a regional expression, but of an ideal that is much more widespread, if that makes sense. And I think the, the, the sort of so far unique nature of the Salma burials is because they are basically foreign. They are people from central Sweden doing that there. Okay. Um, will the social economic aspect of the project look at changes to the social connections of bleak structures and the economic focus of Scandinavian society, which may have come about as a result of the Viking Age? Question mark. I'm not, I'm not sure I answered the question. Did, it, was, was it whether we're going to be looking at the socioeconomic consequences of the yeah, Viking? The, yeah, they are, they are, well, the consequences, I, I'm assuming from the question, um, for contemporary society. Point you it, it, it comes in a little bit to the to the contemporary legacies a kind of um it, instead of you know eating your viking burger actually looking at the sort of the actual modern impacts of the, the vikings but um in terms of detailed research no because we're focusing very much on the the, the early part of, of the Viking Age. Um, having said that, I, I guess a sort of um, sort of end of the Viking phenomenon would be another possible project, um, thinking of continuations, but I, I don't think that's a direction we'll be going in. Right. I think I, I'm going to wind this up there, but Chris, Chris Scull, our director, would you like to add, add anything at the end? Just really to congratulate you on, on such a fluent, informative and um, presentation that gives us such an overview um, and which this is, and this is meant in the most supportive way possible you um, opened um, vistas while not drowning us in, in the detail it was absolutely absolutely masterly in that sense thank you all I can say is I really envy the research environment in which you're working <laughs> um, and I wish it was similarly easy in the UK for example to um, prepare huge large-scale funding like this on questions of post-Roman um, society in the United Kingdom. Um, all I can say, I, I, I applaud you. Wonder, wonderful talk, a wonderful project. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Um, not only do I second that, but quite a lot of the comments, as you've probably noticed, are in the, in the same vein. So thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, it now... To say, but um, I give notice that the next meeting will be the anniversary meeting on Thursday, June the 24th, followed by a reception. A full 
agenda will follow in a mailing in May. Um, I do hope we do manage in June to uh, meet physically in Burlington House, um, as it's uh, the last meeting I will be in the chair. And my term as president ends, should have ended later this month, but uh, um, we deferred the date in the hope of having a real meeting and the handover to my successor, um, Professor Martin Millett. So thank you all very much um, for attending. Hope to see many of you um, in, in the flesh, as it were, or on the screen um, on the 24th of June. Thank you very much. <laughs>